Hey, it's Carlo with All You Can Board with another review here. Today I'm going to be reviewing Gizmos, which is a really fun engine building game. Um, it's really a pure engine builder where you start off with really small, simple turns, and as the game goes on, you're having all sorts of wild chain reactions, doing a lot of stuff on your turns. Uh, it really has this great sense of progression as the game goes on. Um, it's not the perfect game, it does have its flaws and things that maybe hold it back from being a little better, but overall I think it's a great game, and let me tell you a bit more about it. So let's start with the artwork and presentation of the game. Uh, if you see this on a shelf, it is a really nice looking game. Uh, it's bright, it's vibrant, uh, it's got a really kind of um, fun, light-hearted, goofy, cartoony art style, which I like quite a bit. Um, I think it fits really well, especially with the theme of the game, which is that we're all uh, inventors at this great science fair, and we're all competing to build these wacky inventions that have all sorts of things that you know trigger other effects. Um, so it's kind of like a light-hearted, more laid-back kind of theme, uh, and I think that this kind of cartoonish, more light-hearted style fits really well with that. Um, the illustrations themselves on the cards are quite nice, but at the same time, I don't find them, you know, particularly memorable. Um, it's not that there's anything wrong with the way they're drawn, um, but I think it might also have something to do with one of my uh, small issues I have with the game is that the cards themselves, the gizmo cards, don't have anything to, like, th they don't have a name, right? So if I want to refer to a gizmo that's on the board, I have to always say, oh, it's the, the gizmo that converts this into this, or the gizmo, that, the red gizmo that costs this, whereas maybe if the gizmos each had a name, like this one's the you know, the thingamajig, and this one's the whatchamacallit, or the, you know, discombobulator, or whatever. If they gave them these kind of quirky names, maybe it would be easier to identify them, and when you see them on the board, you'd know right away what that card is based on the name, rather than looking for the effect, and, and you know, it's a pretty minor complaint, and not even really a complaint, but just something I think could have made the cards a little more uh, easily identifiable, and would have singled them out a little more, and would have maybe made those illustrations, uh, you know, stand out a little bit more. Uh, as far as other components go, uh, you know, storage rings, dashboards, they're all, you know, pretty basic, but good enough quality, they fit the game well. Um, obviously, you're probably wondering about this dispenser here with the marbles. Uh, it works really well with the game. Um, you know, it's not 100% perfect every once in a while when a marble falls through uh, into the row. Um, you know, it might roll off the little contraption on the bottom and you hear a marble kind of fall and hit the table and you got to move the thing and get to it. But other than that, I think this works, um, not only is it kind of fun and it looks nice on the table and is eye-catching, but I think it also works well as a way to randomize the marbles by kind of putting them in the top and just seeing what comes through the uh, the energy row in the front. So this is a really cool feature that I think works well in the game. I would like to give credit to uh, Come On Games for the iconography on the cards. Um, you know, the way they're laid out, uh, the different symbols for the different uh, parts of your dashboard, like the converters, the filing, picking, all that kind of stuff. Um, where the points are, the cost, everything is very easy to get the hang of. So even when you're introducing this to new players, um, you know, even if someone has the odd question here or there about one of the triggering effects on the top, uh, the little guide that comes with the game is, is very straightforward. So the iconography and the sort of the layout of the cards is very well done. I mentioned before, but the sense of progression you get as this game kind of ramps up and you go from, you know, just taking a single marble on your turn or just building this thing that costs one marble to later, you know, causing these chain reactions that just involve half of your gizmos on your, under your dashboard. Um, it's a really satisfying way that it builds the game up. You really feel like you're making progress as you go. And it also just makes it more fun because you're watching what other players are doing too. Um, I would you know, it's kind of a similar game. It has some similarities to games like Splendor and, you know, Century and those kind of games, uh, both in terms of the engine building as well as kind of the, the complexity of the game. I'd say this one's maybe a little more complex than both Splendor and Century, um, but still has a pretty easy learning curve. Um, but I would say that this really capitalizes on that just engine building aspect more than either of those games, even though I do like Splendor and Century quite a bit. This, the way that, again, you just feel so kind of powerful by the end of the game when you've got like 12, 13 gizmos going, triggering all sorts of stuff, so excellent job on that. Um, as far as the turns go, I like that they've kind of given you a narrow focus of you've got these four options. So every turn you're either going to be doing a file, pick, build, or research, and that's it. So it kind of 
makes your turns not take that long because a lot of the time you kind of have an idea, you know, maybe your storage ring is full and you can't pick anyway, or you have something in your archive and you can't file. So sometimes your turn starts with a narrow decision of which action am I going to take? And then maybe sometimes when you're looking to build, then it might take a bit longer because you're trying to, to decide what to build. So that opens your decision tree a little bit. But ultimately, I like that your turns revolve around start with one of these four choices and every once in a while it might be a little more complex beyond that. Another thing that I like is kind of how the end of the game is determined by the players in a way, right? Because you, you know, the, the end game is triggered either by someone building their 16th gizmo or building their fourth level three gizmo. So the fact that you can be kind of, you know, you might have plans to do something that's going to last longer. You're trying to collect more uh, energy and you want to start maybe researching and filing stuff in your archive, but you see another player racing away, building all these gizmos. Maybe they're already at 13 or 14 and you've only got nine. So that kind of affects how you're going to play the game. If you know that they're racing to end the game, you might want to just worry about getting as many points as you can rather than working on improving your engine because it might be too late to improve your engine. Um, so there's a lot of things to like about how the end of the game is triggered. Since the gizmos in the available display area are constantly changing throughout the game, you also have to be ready to adapt on the fly. Um, the more players there are, of course, the more you have to be able to adapt because not only are these gizmos changing on the board, uh, the energy marbles that are available in the energy row are changing, so you might have a plan on your turn where you think, okay, I'm going to do this now, and then next turn I'll buy that thing there, or I'll take one of those. And with four players, you know, if three other players go, by the time it gets back around to you, the state of the game might have changed a lot more. So I like that there's that kind of difference between two, three, and four player games. There is a certain amount of luck to the game. Uh, I'd say overall there's more skill than luck because your, your overall planning from the start as well as your you know, ability to create that engine but also adapt on the fly to what's available to you um, probably factors in more. But you might also have, you know, you, you need a specific type of energy. Maybe you need battery, the black energy. And maybe, you know, the energy dispenser just keeps churning out yellow, red, and blue, which is the electric, heat, and atomic. So, in a way, you might get unlucky with that, or you might be looking for a specific type of card that's in one of these decks, and it's never coming up, and then it's, you decide, okay, whatever, I'll just build one of these other ones for now. And then at the end of your turn, you flip over one from the top to replace it with, and maybe that was the one you needed, and then the next person goes and they buy that right out from under you. In a way, it's unlucky, but they also you know, have this research um, option on your turn which kind of gets rid of that aspect of luck in a way because, yeah, maybe I flipped the one off the top at the end of my turn that I wanted to buy and now someone else is going to buy it. But if I had researched instead, I would have seen that one and I could have filed it away or built it anyway. So there's definitely some luck, but there are enough ways in here to kind of play around it and make it so it doesn't have too big of, a, of an effect on the game overall. Uh, the different levels of cards are quite interesting. I like how, you know, you have these level one cards where you kind of start small, maybe you have a converter that converts one energy type into another, or an upgrade that allows you to hold, you know, one more energy in your storage ring and file something else. So it starts small, and then the level two and three ones ramp up. I do wish there was maybe a little more variety in the level one and two cards. The level three ones are great. I really like how the variety in them, uh, they're really interesting. Some of them just have a sort of end game, um, you know, point scoring. Uh, feature to them. Other ones continue to, you know, add to your engine building mechanics. Uh, but I really do like how you kind of shuffle up the deck of um, the level three ones, and you remove 20 from the game at the start. So it really adds to the variety of each game you play is going to have a different set of level three gizmos available. So even though Gizmos isn't, uh, you know, a perfect game and isn't my absolute favorite engine builder out there. Uh, I have to say that it's more fun than most of the ones I've played. Uh, I can't stress enough how fun the game is. Um, the theme really plays a big part in that, how we're kind of just inventors competing at this science fair. Uh, the illustrations, the kind of, you know, the marble dispenser and everything, and then just watching these wild chain reactions trigger throughout the game is just a whole lot of fun. Uh, you'll have a blast playing this with anyone. Uh, it's also important to note that it's fun at all player counts, so two, three, or four. I mean, this game just moves so quick, and it's one of the best things about it is how quick your turn is. Uh, obviously, as the game goes on, the turns tend to take a little bit longer as you're trying to figure out the order of triggering your gizmos, or when you do have to trigger multiple uh, gizmos in a turn, sometimes it takes longer, but it doesn't make it any less fun for me. Again, this isn't some, you know, brutal competitive theme. There's no war theme or anything. Um, and even as far as kind of like competing rivals, this isn't Christopher Nolan's The Prestige where Robert Angier and, uh, you know, Alfred Borden are 
vying to thwart each other at every step of the way. No, we're each kind of doing our own thing and there's a bit of interaction around the table, but ultimately we're just trying to see who can do this best. I also like how, uh, in my experience at least so far, the scores at the end of the game have all been pretty close. Um, it's kind of nice how all the points that people have are kind of open information. Uh, because the only points you get are from the actual gizmo cards along with these uh, victory point tokens here, you can always kind of, if you really want, you can look over and see what everyone's current points are. So if you see that you're only behind by one or two and it's getting close to the end of the game, or if you're behind by, you know, eight or ten points and there's a few turns left, you think, it can kind of, uh, you know, inform you on what kind of decisions to make and what strategy to carry forward. Um, but it always keeps the games fun because I've never found that anyone's been out of it with a substantial amount of time left in the game. So it keeps everyone involved and engaged. As far as the value of the game goes, you really can't go wrong with gizmos. Um, I mean, for the cost, I think I got this for about 35 or 40 bucks Canadian. Um, the replay value is quite high, thanks in part to the, uh, you know, the different level 3 cards that come out in every different game, as well as how the board starts out, like which cards are available in the display area, because that will really determine the first you know, few actions you take, or the first few gizmos you get, which kind of will determine what sort of engine you're building. So it does feel like every game is unique, uh, and also because of, as I mentioned, how quick the turns go and how quick the game is, I mean, most games of this, even with three or four players, like, I don't think I've ever had a game of Gizmos take longer than an hour. It's usually about 30, 40 minutes. So if you're looking for a really satisfying engine building experience where the turns just fly by, um, you really can't find too many better choices than Gizmos. Um, I'd also like to add that it's addictive because you sort of feel like, and this is the case with a lot of engine builders, where the game ends right as you feel like your engine is taking off and you just kind of got things going and it makes you feel like, oh, I should have had that engine working that well earlier so I could have taken advantage of it. So there's always that feeling of wanting to start over and do better and try to determine where you wasted actions and where you could have been more efficient with your engine. So it has that addictive quality that makes you want to keep coming back. And thanks in part to how short it is, uh, there's really no reason not to come back to it over and over again uh, to see how much better you can do each time. Overall, as a package, this is a great game that I highly recommend. Uh, it might not be the one that you get to the table all the time. Uh, you might have other engine builders you prefer over it. For example, I tend to prefer Race for the Galaxy, but it is a heavier game that's much harder to teach people and does take a bit longer to play. Um, but overall, considering the kind of fun theme, the wackiness of all this, with all the gizmos, kind of these chain reactions, uh, it's great, really fun, lots of replayability, uh, and for the price, you really can't go wrong. So uh, I definitely recommend you check out gizmos. And that's about it for this review. Uh, if you'd like to see any more of our content, feel free to check out our website at www.allyoucanboard.com as well as our YouTube channel and other social media. Thanks for watching.